chapter 10 and verse 1. And now it came to pass when Adonai Zedek, king of Jerusalem, had heard how Joshua had taken Ai and had utterly destroyed it, as he had done to Jericho and her king, so he had done to Ai and her king, and how the inhabitants of Gibeon had made peace with Israel and were among them, that they feared greatly, because Gibeon was a great city, as one of the royal cities, and because it was greater than Ai, and all the men thereof were mighty. And our title is Miracles of Conquest. And there were so many matters in this 10th chapter of Joshua which help us and apply to us today. Now, to understand the book of Joshua, you must appreciate that the central and southern conquest, which came first, runs up to here, to the end of chapter 10. And then from chapter 11, you're dealing with the northern conquest. And to see how the book works, you must appreciate that there is a tremendous change of gear between chapter 10 and chapter 11. The events up to the end of chapter 10 occur in very rapid succession. And the central and southern conquest is over almost as soon as it began. It's stunning and speedy and almost total. But from chapter 11, the pace of the book runs much more slowly. And what takes place in the northern conquest takes a number of years, up to seven almost. So it's a terrific change of gear between chapters 10 and 11. And if you happily read along as though the uh, narrative is following the same pace, well, you have a wrong conception of it. There is a profound change, and it's obvious to see. The uh, conquest, we've looked at some of these matters. It wasn't a land grab. It wasn't Joshua's idea. It wasn't uh, just for territorial gain. It was something which went right back to Abraham and the promises of God and the covenant of God with that people. And it was promised and predicted far over the centuries. And of course, uh, and most specifically through Moses. So it was long decreed and long prophesied. It wasn't just an individual's idea of conquest. And it's plain also that it was a moral and divine judgment. That was the nature of the conquest. It was God at work. When it was first of all promised at the time of Abraham, <coughs> It was pointed out that this land could not be taken and conquered, not for many years to come, because the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet complete. And you could see that God was working to a plan. And once the Canaanite nations, their sin had reached a mighty crescendo, then they would be judged. And that would be the time that the children of Israel came in to the promised land. So it was a moral and divine judgment. And to prove that, and to authenticate that, it's attended by miracles, constantly, from the very beginning, from the parting of the Red Sea, and the giving of the manna, and the provision of the water, and then miracles that we'll see even in this 10th chapter, as we get into it. And you can see, we've considered it, that one of the first things that Joshua did was to obey the command of God given originally to Moses that he would go to Mount to Ebal and there would erect an altar and alongside that altar there would be built a substantial wall which would be plastered and on it would be inscribed the Ten Commandments which would shine out across the valley over to Bruza, and then those commandments and also the blessings and the curses of God attending them 
would be proclaimed in a loud voice across the valley. So there was this great proclamation, a grand convocation, and of course all the spies of the Canaanites would be aware of it and would observe it. And this, these were the standards of God for the land from now on. These would be the terms of demanded surrender before fighting took place, that the land would be under the law of God. And these standards were diametrically opposed to the conduct of the Canaanites, <coughs> who would be under judgment. And then after that proclamation, the Canaanites were infuriated. And we went through the scriptures to demonstrate that it was the convocation of Ebal that infuriated the Canaanites more than anything else, exasperated and filled with fury that they would have to submit as the only condition of peace to the laws of the God of Israel. And then we read about the Gibeonite capitulation, and in its own way, it's a tremendous type or symbol or picture of repentance before God, although their faith was by no means perfect, and they also employed cunning to trick Joshua, as you know, but I won't repeat those things. So there was an element of deceit in their approach. Joshua was fooled. Nevertheless, it was the will of God that, if you like, the repentance or the capitulation of the Gibeonite cities would be accepted. And their uh, treaty with Joshua was to last for 400 years until Saul broke it and was punished for so breaking it. So it's in that background that we come to the 10th chapter and we read about uh, Adonazidek of Jerusalem and four other Amorite kings who form a confederacy. But I want to begin just by painting this background a little. The children of Israel are not happy with Joshua and they murmured, and murmured is a loaded word in the Pentateuch, and it reminds us of the bad spirit of the people in the time of Moses, in their wanderings in the wilderness. And now there's an instance of murmuring, because the people didn't understand the peace that was offered to those who would take it. Only the Gibeonites took it in the whole of the conquest of the promised land, but they took it, and it was precious, and it was important, but the people didn't understand that, especially in the light of their deceit, that this treaty would stand, and that they would be accepted by Israel, yes, as servants, cures of wood, and all the rest of it, but they'd keep their lives, and they would be accepted. And Joshua was unpopular for that, and there was murmuring against the princes of the people and Joshua on account of it. So you might think that when the Amorite kings, the confederacy of five large city states, decided to attack the Gibeonites, if, let's just suppose, that Joshua had been a, a worldly aggressor engaged on a massive territorial grab, you might think he would be grimly pleased about that. Why, this would remove an embarrassment. The Gibeonites were an embarrassment to him. In the eyes of his people, he had appeared to be taken in by them, and they didn't think he should have been, and they didn't want the Gibeonites. They didn't understand quite how the mercy of God was operating here. And so uh, it had lowered his stock, as they say, considerably. And now the Amorites are preparing in their fury to destroy them. Well, a worldly leader just bent on aggression would say, that suits me. An embarrassment will be removed. The people will forget all about what they perceive as my great mistake. And we shall no longer have the Gibeonites to worry about. Let it take its course. We owe them nothing. They deceived us. 
But that's not how John, Joshua saw it, although he no doubt smarted a little for the deceit element in the way the Gibeonites had sought their treaty. It's at the same time, he knew it was of God's will, that they should be accepted, and he knew that he had to stand with them. Now, the embarrassing moment comes in verse 6 of chapter 10. And the men of Gibeon sent unto Joshua to the camp to Gilgal, saying, Slack not thy hand from thy servants. Come up to us quickly and save us and help us. For all the kings of the Amorites that dwell in the mountains are gathered together against us. Well, Joshua could have said, You expect me to defend you? with the people potentially not in favour of this and very much agreed that we've given peace to the Gibeonites. Do you expect me to call upon my armed men to risk life and limb and to protect you Gibeonites? But it was what he must do. It was proper and right that he should do that. Joshua, in this respect, is worthily described as a type of Christ. Now these people are under the protection of Israel. He's made a treaty with them. Yes, he's got to swallow hard, and against the wishes of his people, he's got to deal with them and protect them as though they were Israelites. It's rather like us. Here we are, the vast majority of us in this hall gathered tonight. We are Gentiles. We are saved Gentiles. We who had no part in the promises of God and the ancient covenants of God with his typical people, now we, like the Gibeonites, have been pardoned and forgiven. And by the instrumentality of God, we've been gathered in. And our Joshua, our Saviour Christ protects us and keeps us just as though we were saved Jews. He makes no difference between the children of Israel who are elect and saved and those Gentiles who are brought in and who are elect and saved. And just as the uh, Gibeonites turned to Joshua and said, you've got to defend us. You've got to save us. So we turn to Christ and we receive his defense and protection. And we are treated as though we are true Israelites. And we better be worthy of that calling and of that station. And in that sense, all that's taking place here in the history of Joshua is typical of Christ and how he deals with his children. So, verse 7, Joshua ascended from Gilgal, and the word ascended is a good one. I expect there were grumblers. We are having to defend the Gibeonites, and uh, we've got the worst of this. For us, it's an uphill climb into mountain and hill strongholds, into strange territories, into a people more numerous and more aggressive than we've ever encountered before. And we're not even doing it for ourselves. We're doing it for the Gibeonites. So Joshua ascended from Gilgal, he and all the people of war with him, and all the mighty men of valor. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. There shall not a man of them stand before thee. Why did the Amorite kingdoms, the five of them, decide to go against the Gibeonites? Was it simply to dissuade others from breaking ranks and making peace with Israel? Was it because they feared a new society in their region based on law and harmony and love and they couldn't stand the thought of that? Was it just fury and hatred of the new standards? They were filled, the text tells us that at the same time they were filled with fear 
of Israel and yet fury towards those who capitulated to Israel. Well, the fury prevailed and they went on the attack or declared themselves. And now we're talking about Joshua's deliverance of the Gibeonites. And I come down to verse 8. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear them not, for I have delivered them into thine hand. Joshua therefore, verse 9, came unto them suddenly, and went up from Gilgal all night. And the passage says, The Lord discomforted them before Israel. Which literally means, the Hebrew, that the Lord created a tremendous clamour and noise. Some people translate it panic, which is good. Discomforted them, threw them into fear, panic, and uh, they seem to have been defeated, not so much by the swords of Israel, physically wielded, for they were involved, but by the Lord putting them on the run, causing them to flee, filling them with terror and noise and clamor so that they ran. And the oppressors suffered a great slaughter and they were chased and the route is given in verse 10 to a place called Makeda. And then you have the miracles, the hailstones in verse 11, great stones from heaven. If you don't mind me giving you a personal anecdote, I was in uh, uh, the city of Ripon uh, for uh, <coughs> visiting ministry. I think it was 1968 or 69, a very long time ago. And I was in a private house before meetings in the late afternoon. And it was the most astonishing and terrifying storm. So bad that uh, people died. It leads not so far away through this event. The underpasses, the subways, under the main road in the centre of Leeds, used to happen out here until very recently. They flooded in seconds with water and all the people in those subways were drowned. Nothing like it had happened before or since. And farm buildings were destroyed everywhere. A lot of people were hurt. Well, I was indoors. But I remember hailstones the size of tennis balls coming down with such fury and just destroying the garden plants that I could see out of the window and so on. So I don't know how large these hailstones were, possibly even larger. But I've seen a phenomenon which involved giant hailstones and maybe you have too. But it was uh, miraculously given in this instance and more people died from them than died from running before the sword. And then Joshua, verse 12, seems to be inspired to call upon God for a miracle. Now I can't imagine that he would have done this if God had not moved him to do it. And the record doesn't say that happened, but I'm sure it must have done. Then spake Joshua to the Lord in the day when the Lord delivered up the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said, very dramatic this, in the sight of Israel, as though he is addressing the sun and the moon, but it's obviously a prayer, and everybody understood that. Sun, stand thou still upon Gibeon, and thou moon in the valley of Adrelon. And God answered the prayer. And it's recorded here in Holy Scripture that it's the only occasion that God stayed the sun in this way of the light. Well, people argue as to whether it was a miracle of refraction of light or whether it was a miracle of Earth's rotation. I haven't a clue about those things. And uh, I can't say it interests me all that much. It happened. God did it. And they had an extra day to destroy the enemy. And naturally we ask, why? Why did God 
do such an amazing thing, a double miracle. But it's a triple miracle, really, although the discomforting of the enemy, that was to happen repeatedly through the pages of the Old Testament. But the hailstones didn't, and certainly the staying of the sun didn't happen again. They were miracles not to be repeated. But well, why did God do them? There's always a purpose and a great significance. And the significance is this, that uh, uh, it is to attest and to authenticate Joshua as their leader and to establish before the people that what he's done is in pursuit of an important principle. The protection of the Gibeonites against the, the aggression of the Amorites was an important principle. They're within the camp of Israel now. And Zion will protect them. God will protect them. And it was right for Joshua to do that. So they've been murmuring, they've been grumbling, and the miracle dispels it all. And at a stroke, establishes Joshua firmly as leader, dispels all the doubts of the people, and holds up this as an important principle. And it's an important principle that lasts for us today. But these miracles won't be repeated. It's rather like Pentecost. The miracle of Pentecost was followed by three miniature Pentecosts over the years, <coughs> which all had a special purpose and an affirmation. But Pentecost wasn't to be repeated in the life of the church. It was the inauguration of the Holy Spirit as the, in the rule of Christ's church. It was a great authentication of all that God was doing that he had moved from the Jewish church to the Jewish Gentile church of Christ. You might wonder what had happened if there had been some charismatic Israelites at the time of Joshua. They wouldn't have accepted charismatic Israelites. They didn't exist, fortunately, in those days. They don't seem to have done, according to the record. But if they had, they would be saying, well, this uh, miracle of hailstone should happen again. I can see them on the hillsides, forming prayer meetings with their hands raised in the air, crying out to God for more hailstones every time there was a battle. Crying out to God for another saying of the sun. Miracles, miracles, we must have miracles. But it wasn't the will of God. The miracles inaugurated everything, established and helped the faith of the people, confirmed and authenticated Joshua. They had specific purposes, showed that the purpose of defending those who come to you for mercy was right and proper. They'd served their task. Now you have to exercise faith. Now you have to wield your sword. When it comes to the northern conquest, it's the sword and prayer and faith, not miracles, and nobody's calling for. And we have to persuade people to grasp that today. So there's much to be learned from the way it all happened and the way it was carried out. That long day. You have long days today if you pray for them. You don't need to God to stay in the sun for you. If you're doing the king's business, if you're in gospel work, if you're following the Lord, and sometimes it's just all too much for you, and you're exhausted and you wonder if you can cope, you call upon him, he'll do something which is just as good as a long day. He'll give you an infusion of strength and energy and capacity do it and accomplish it in the time you have at your disposal. That's what the long day means to us. God will find a way of giving his people strength and seeing them through in all their circumstances. It's an assurance, but no longer will the day be lengthened. 
but there's something even of greater importance in this. Don't you see, these uh, Gibeonites as well as the Amorites and all the Canaanites, they were worshippers of the heavens. <coughs> the sun to them was a god. The moon was another god. The stars were gods. They were gods with their own power. What an impression it made when Joshua, in the hearing of vast numbers of people, prays a prayer to the heavens for the sun to be saved, and that the prayer of Joshua, and by the power of God, it is done. And Canaanite belief in the deity of the sun collapses at a stroke. The sun is subject to the Almighty God, and even the prayers of a man. So it's the most powerful, imaginable testimony against the idolatry <coughs> of the Canaanites and the Gibeonites to leave it all behind. They were now servants or wished to be of the one true God who commanded all things. So there are many things to learn from the giving of these unusual miracles at that time. Come down to chapter 10 and verse 17. And it was told Joshua, saying, the five kings, the five defeated Amorite kings, are found hid in a cave at Makeda. Well, dear friends, there they were. One moment, the aggressors, breathing fire and fury, determined to destroy the Gibeonites and ultimately the Israelites. And now, somehow or other, the kings have lost their armies. They've managed, as kings are apt to do, to escape the trouble <coughs> and to get together. And they're all in the same cave, licking their wounds and wondering what's happened and how it's all gone wrong. There they are. And Joshua says, leave them alone just for the moment. There's important work to be done. Roll stole stones over, up to the mouth of the cave and go after the troops who are fleeing back to their cities to barricade them and re-fortify them against any problems. <clears throat> and so there's a more important job to be done before he can deal with the kings. But he comes back to the kings, ultimately. And then we read down in verse 24, it came to pass when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, he seems to do a barbaric thing, but actually this is very, very important. When they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came there and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua, he pronounced these words, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage, for thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. And afterwards, Joshua smote them, slew them, and hanged them. But why did he order this strange ritual, if you like, of the captains, the subordinate generals, putting their feet on the necks of the kings? In the Bible, that seems to have been a pharaoh trick. That seems to have been a pagan habit, to put your defeated enemy, humiliate him under your feet and tread on the neck. And now the Israelites, of whom there's no sign of them having done this in their culture, nor in their opportunity. 
now being required to do the same. Is there a lesson there? Well, there is, dear friends. Joshua has in mind the strengthening of their faith and courage. He is an inspired leader. There's something yet to be done, not just to hang the evil kings, but to bring his subordinate generals to put their feet upon their necks. They didn't think it could be done. They've always had misgivings about whether Israel is really strong enough for all this. Things are going to get worse. The tribes are even more fierce and numerous and well-armed and barbaric in the north of the country. How are we going to fare? Faith is shaky. They need to have their faith strengthened. The living God did this. He put them to flight before you. He sent the hailstones. He enabled you to accomplish all this. When it was against you, it was an uphill task literally for you. You had the inferior positions. But he's done this. Now you've got to remember it and thank him. And as you put your feet upon the necks of these people, I will say the words, fear not, nor be dismayed, be strong and of good courage. And the lesson is, there is little which is more important among the people of God than the constant task of strengthening faith. When the preacher is preparing his ministry, be it Sunday morning, or Wednesday evening, or at any time, he must pause and he must ask a number of questions about things as they emerge in his plan to present and expound or explain these truths. And among those questions must be this one. What am I going to be teaching here which strengthens faith? Is this faith strengthening? It must always be represented. Our great need is of faith as God's people. Preacher people were all the same. Our great need is to go forth every Monday trusting him, laying everything before him. I will be held accountable if I'm not endeavouring to strengthen faith. That's what Joshua is doing. He's a mighty general. Oh, General Joshua, it's time for celebrations. Your scheme of things was brilliant. We could never have imagined things would go so well. Joshua's not interested. Come here. Come here. Put your feet upon the necks of those men who you feared. And I will say these great words of comfort. You need faith because it's God who acts for us. You need faith to be calling upon him and relying upon him. Tremendous that Joshua did this. And we have our different ways whereby we must do it today. So this passage, these are the lessons. Behind it all was the hatred of the Amorites for the standards of God. It's obvious Joshua was not just driven by territorial conquest or he would have let the Amorite kings destroy the Gibeonites. <coughs> Instead of which, he does the hard thing and defends them because this is a spiritual matter. The miracles endorse Joshua. They do so much. They encourage the people. They symbolize God's giving of strength to his people. They crush the worshippers of sun and moon as gods. They indicate Joshua as a type of Christ. Feet on the necks of the defeated kings, the necessity of building courage and faith all the time. 
right to the Christian life. And Joshua's words really mean the battle is the Lord's and we must never forget that. Our parking situation, every trial that confronts us, the battle is the Lord's. We'll be industrious, we'll try and find alternatives, we'll negotiate, we'll do all sorts of things, but all the time in our minds is this, we depend upon the hand of God. So all these messages crowd in to these chapters wonderfully and constantly. Let's close our thinking, singing together the hymn 301. Hymn number 301. I am waiting.